We love our country. We love our families. We love our freedom. And we love our God. America has always been the land of dreams because America is a nation of true believers. Since the signing of the Declaration of Independence 241 years ago, America always affirmed that liberty comes from our Creator. Because in America, we don't worship government, we worship God. And we're going to see all the way into the future. And the future is going to be beautiful, and the future is going to be bright. We will not fail. Our rights are given to us by God, and no earthly force can ever take those rights away. It is why our currency proudly declares, in God we trust. And it's why we proudly proclaim that we are one nation under God every time we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Cities small and large will see a rebirth of hope, safety, and opportunity. We want all children to have the opportunity to know the blessings of God. We are the country that is always on the cusp of the next invention. There is no limit to what we can achieve. All it takes is a bold and daring vision and the will to make it happen. We are Americans and the future belongs to us. We can only restore this nation we love so much by working and building with all of you. And always remember to trust each other, work with each other, and love each other. We are all made by the same almighty God. And though we have many stories, we all share one home and one glorious destiny, a destiny that's getting better and better every single day. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America prosper again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, to another prophecy update. It has been a while since we've been able to do one. I'm speaking to a small audience here at the Media Center and as well as to our listening audience throughout the world tonight. Some very important events have taken place, and so we decided that we would uh, come together and talk about some of the things that have taken place in this world today and how it affects us prophetically. What we're going to do, uh, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to play a about six minute video clip to introduce us to the subject tonight. And I know that uh, probably most of you have been in, in a donated with videos, uh, uh, emails like I have, talking about the events that's, that have taken place. So we want to have a, uh, uh, just a word of prayer and uh, then we are going to show a video clip that will just introduce us to the subject tonight and we will go from there. So let's, at this point in time, let us have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we come before thy righteous and holy throne. And we ask, Lord, that your presence will be here with us tonight. The subject matter that we're dealing with is very serious, extremely serious. And especially for those of us that are members of the Remnant Church. And so, Lord, we just ask for your guidance, your directions, ask for your help, and ask, Lord, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us guidance and direction, Lord, as to what we need to do. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I said, I'm going to try to be a techie here, and I'm going to try to uh, play a video. Please put this video. I want you to listen to the video. Those that are uh, uh, by October 
channel as well as those that are in the audience. And I'm going to just step back.
confirmed from the fulfillment of the ultimate prophecy, the return of the Messiah, Yeshua. So head up, watch the Middle East, because that is where it will all come to pass in the day and the years ahead. God bless you. All right, brothers and sisters, those that are here in the audience with us and those that are viewing by channel, I'm going to now go to the presentation for the night and we'll talk about the clip that you just saw. Uh, so let me see if I can be a techie one more time. Okay, I succeeded, praise the Lord. Okay, let's have another short word of prayer. Father in heaven, again, in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, we come before thy righteous and holy throne. And just ask, Lord, you be here with us tonight as we open up your word and as we study together. We believe from what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, that time is very short. And we need to see the seriousness of the time in which we live. Thank you again for all that you have done for us and all that you will do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, saints, this is Prophecy Update. It has been a while since we've had a Prophecy Update. As you know, we have been constructing a building here. We are in this building tonight. Uh, it is still not 100% complete, but it's very close. And uh, so we are here tonight to give our first Prophecy Update uh, from this facility. We had Barbara O'Neill here last week, well, two weeks ago, what, three weeks ago? Now, well, I may see someone this month. Anyway. Uh, but this is our first prophecy update, the first of many that we are going to be having here. There's a lot of things in the works, uh, some Bible studies. We're going to have Bible study classes here. We've got another school, uh, School of the Prophets coming up, and we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation. But right now, let's get into the presentation for the night. We're talking about prophecy update, prophecy update. The Bible says we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto we do well that we take heed as unto a light that shines into a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. We are told that ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists and with this behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. This is a slide that we normally use and here's another slide that we normally use uh, as we come into our prophecy update, but tonight we're using another one. We're going to first talk about our purpose here at Apocalypse Ministry. And I've, talk, I've said this many times, and I'm going to say it again tonight, because if this is our only purpose here at this ministry, our only purpose, and we get to look at what God wants, uh, is, is doing so that we can line up with what God is doing. So this is our only purpose. Look what she says. She says, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him when? During the investigative judgment. Now, I can talk to the audience here tonight. I can't talk to those that are viewing by channel, but I can talk to the audience. And my question to the audience tonight is, can a dead person stand true to God? A dead person cannot stand true to God. So obviously, the prophet here is speaking of the investigator's judgment of the living. So, the God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world. So let's look at the third angel's message this evening. Let's look at the third. Now, I know that the prophet speaks of these sometimes in tandem and what she's talking about, the third angel's message, she's talking about the first, second, and third. But tonight, we just want to look at the third. Just the third. So, are we there? And those that are viewing on the channel, we ask you to get your Bible, get your King James Bible, and let's look at the third angel's message, which will be Revelation 14, and starting at verses 9 through 12. This is the third angel's message. Now, we know in order to, be a, to have a third, you have to have a first and a second. But the third angel's message is a warning against 
refusing number one and number two. So let's, let's look at number three. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is what God is going to do if anyone receives the mark of the beast. Verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Verses 12. Let's read it together, saints. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, this is the third angel. It is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast and the dire consequences of doing so. So God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we publish, we establish, and maintain our uh, publishing houses, our uh, schools, our sanitarium, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and, and food factories. During the construction of this addition to the building, God moved upon my heart to make every one of those institutions be a part of this, 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 this building. So we have endeavored to have a publishing house here. This, we're in the school section, the learning center. That was a space set off of the sanitarium space for the hygienic restaurant, treatment room, and food factory. So all of those institutions are in here to some degree. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message is to prepare a people to stand true to him. Do you get this, saints? So God has to have a people that will stand in spite of what's coming down the pike. We need to be able to stand. And so, actually, what we're going to talk about tomorrow evening, starting at 4 o'clock, is more important than what we're talking about tonight, because I have been getting a lot of emails, just a whole lot of emails and a whole lot of clips talking about what just took place. And I, in all of them, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for everyone that have sent me emails and what have you, but in all the emails and all the comments, I found a missing link. The missing link is, what are we to do in light of what's taking place? And tomorrow we're going to talk about what we need to do. Because that's more important, because this is prophecy what we're talking about tonight. But what do we need to do in light of what's taking place, brothers and sisters? That's the big deal. If we are not able to stand true when this thing goes down, then we're lost. Do we understand that? So we need to know what to do. You know, when Peter started preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he, and he went through that, that 22-verse sermon, at the end, the men says, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so what we hear this in this audience tonight and those that are viewing from wherever you are, what we need to know is what do we do now? Are you hearing me say? And that is what I have missed in all the comments and things that, that have come to me. No one is talking about what we need to do. So saints, we're going to, tomorrow evening we're going to talk about what we do. We, we have advertised as a question and answer. And it is going to be a question answer, but we're going to dig into what do you and I need to be doing now. All right. She goes on and said, this is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. This is our purpose. So God's purpose, his whole purpose, the whole plan of salvation comes down to having a people that will stand true to him. Are you with me, saints? That's God's whole purpose is to have a people that will stand true to him. We got to understand that. I mean, your, your, your diet, your, your country living, your dress, I mean, whatever it is, all these things need to prepare you to stand true to him. As we were told that country living, uh, if living in the city is going to be ten times harder to develop the character you need. So she recommends getting into the country so it, it can help you develop your character. Because this is what this is all about, brothers and sisters. It's about developing a character that will stand true to God when this investigative judgment passes from the dead to the living at the passing of the National Assembly. Now, brothers and sisters, I say this very kindly. 
I said it's very common. I don't know of anyone out there that's telling people that you got to stand true to God when it's investigated in the past from the dead. That you got to be at a sinless condition. I know of no one that's doing that. Of all the big ministries, and I said it's Cali. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, hey, look, we, look, this apocalypse ministry. No, I don't want to get to what you call the Elijah complex. Lord, I'm the only one. Lord said, no, I have 7,000. I'm not about it. So I know God has 7,000. But what I'm saying, saints, this is the point that's being missed. We are not telling the people, you got to have victory over sin. This is not being said. And to, to know all of this stuff and be able to expound upon it and not know what I need to do. Brothers and sisters, is not going to be of any consequence. I can stand up and expound to you right now if I don't get my life together. Brothers and sisters, and you know that's the scary thing because the prophet says there will be men that's going to stand up and be able to expound and explain every point of our faith and explain the prophecies and they themselves are going to be lost. That's scary to me. Are you hearing me say? I'm speaking to the audience and I'm speaking to the cameras. Let's go. All right. Stand true. Invest at the investigator's judgment, and that investigator's judgment will pass from the dead to the living at the passing of the national syndrome. Now, I want, I, want, I want everyone here and those that are viewing to recognize that the passing of the son of law don't mean that immediately your probation closed. You've still got to make a decision. But the thing of it is, when that son of law passes, it's too late for you to get your character together. Are you hearing me, saints? That's the key. Once the son of law passed, it's too late for you to develop a character. You're just not going to have time to do it. And you're going to be thrown into, into more and more uh, problems. Okay, let's go. Our sanitation have been established for the purpose of preparing a people for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. We don't even have them anymore. Now, here's our slide for tonight. This is the one we're using tonight. We need to look at the way marks. See, here we, 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 we see something has happened. We see October 31st has come and gone, and something, a major proportion, has taken place. And listen, saints, I have to say this, and I say it very, very, very kind. I don't hear a peep from the church leaders. The most, listen, the most major prophetic event in modern times have taken place, and I don't hear a peep from leadership. Now, this is God's church. Don't get me wrong. Don't believe it. This is God's church. But that lets you know what Satan is doing. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual weakness in high places. And when we understand the issues at hand, brothers and sisters, we're going to see that Satan is mounting a major offensive. A major offensive. The prophet says, those who place themselves under God's control to be led and guided by him will catch the steady tread of the events ordained by him to take place. In other words, God has ordained some things to take place. I'll tell you right now, saints, in every church, every Seventh-day Adventist church tomorrow, the, the, the subject ought to be on this right here. Every Seventh-day Adventist church throughout the entire world, the subject matter for tomorrow need to be on what took place October 31st. It's that major, brothers and sisters. Extremely major. And I, and I said this very kindly. I was talking to someone today, and they, they said, well, they said, well, what happened on October 31st? We don't understand what has happened. don't understand the significance, how major this is. We're going to try tonight to help you to understand how major it was, and tomorrow we're going to talk about prophecy update, the way marks, brothers and sisters. We need to be looking at the way marks from where it started to where it's going. And Ellen G. White tells us in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 307, she says, we are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. Are you with me, saying? We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. And the Bible says the same thing. Let's go to our Bible. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 46 and verses 10. 
9 and 10. I believe we're going to read 9 and 10. Let's read 9 and 10. Are we there, saints? Those that are on the channel, get your Bibles. Don't just listen to me. Get your Bibles. This is Prophecy Update. Remember this. Uh, verse 9. Remembering the former things of old. Oh, God through Isaiah says, look, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10, let's read together. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God is saying, listen, I have declared the end from the beginning. I've told you from time past what's going to take place in the future. That's what God is saying here. I'm telling you everything is going to take place. So let's see what has God told us was going to take place. And let's see if what took place October 31st did God tell us this. Are you with me, saints? Do you understand now? Let's see what has God told us was going to take place from, the, from, from ancient times. And let's see if October, did he tell us about October 31st? Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And what this is going to do for us, it's going to help us to have faith in the word of God. Are you with me? And you know what the Bible says? Nevertheless, will the son of man find faith when he comes to this earth? You know, this, this, uh, we tried to get the word out because this, this thing happened kind of impromptu. We tried to get the word out. We need this place filled up tonight, saints. Uh, everybody need to hear this. I, I have to say this. As, as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to hear this. And we're not here. All right, let's go. That's major right there. Are you, are you with me, saying? Let me, let me back it up. That's major. That's major. Who do we have on the left? Who is Pope Francis? What is he? He's a Catholic. Who is this guy on the right? That's the Archbishop of the Lutheran Federation. Victor, what is that? Talana. He is a Lutheran. He is the Archbishop. Are you hearing me say this? He is the head of the Lutheran Church. This is historic, and this is prophetic. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let me say it again. This is historic, and this is prophetic. Nothing has happened in modern times like this. Nothing. There's no prophecy that's been fulfilled that's of this major proportion. And we're told that we're told that the prophet says that ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of seven day Adventists. And with this, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin. Brothers and sisters, we need to know what's going on. And since, and when, and since saints, all of us is directed at shutting us down. You'll see this. Now, there's something else you need to see up here. Now, let me back it up. Look at this embrace. Look at this embrace. Look at this, brother and sister. This man is a what? He is a Jesuit. Do you know that's major? Do you understand here tonight, do you, those that are viewing my, do you understand how major this is? This man is a Jesuit. And no one is saying a word about it. Here's a Jesuit oath. Now, this is the, look, this is the first time that a pope had been chosen from the Jesuit order. This is the first time. We want to find out why was he chosen. I furthermore promise and declare, this is just part of the oath now. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics. Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. Let me ask you this. History, have they tried to do that? Yes. When did they try to do that, saints? Through the Dark Ages. How many people were killed during the Dark Ages by the orders of the Jesuits? And, and 
50 to 100 million. Do you know that the Bible says that this is going to be repeated? Do we know that, thing? And that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. I'm going to recommend a book to you. Ellen G. White says I would rather see this book uh, distributed more than silver or gold. I want you to read, and you need to do this about it before tomorrow evening. You need to read The Separation of Luther from Rome. You need to read Luther before the dyke. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? And then if you can, read the Swiss Reformer. Those three chapters go together. You're talking about Zingwe. I mean, saints, you know, I, I, listen, I've read a great controversy two or three times, but I've never read and understood it like I read, I'm, I'm understanding it now. Brothers and sisters, look, look here. Look, those, I, you know, when I, when I got a great controversy just like this that I've torn up completely from reading it. But I didn't get out of that one what I'm getting now. Are you hearing me, saints? And I always make my own index as I'm reading. You know, I've got things I'm, I'm seeing that I need to remember where this is. I'm, listen, brothers and sisters, and I know all of us probably got 10 or 15 great controversies in your house, never read them. Get the book out and read it. You know, I used to wonder, you know, all the history in the book. You know, I wanted to get, get past the, the history. No, all saints, we, we need to read this history part, these, these reformers. When you understand what Luther did and understand what has happened now, Brothers and sisters, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Look what it says. Hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. Rip up the stomachs and wounds of their women and crush their infant's head against the walls. Have you ever heard of the book, Fox Book of Mortars? If you can read Fox Book of Mortars, you'll see they did exactly that. One woman, uh, 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 the, 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 the Catholic ruffian broke into the, the building, and this woman was pregnant. She was about ready to be delivered. And the midwife begged the, 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 the ruffians to say, spare her and let her, de- let her deliver the, the baby. This was like, I think that it said, like this was her ninth or tenth baby. They had a lot of babies back then. <laughs> but they broke in where she was about to be delivered, took the woman, and threw her out of the window. And when the woman landed on, 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 down on, on the ground, the baby came forth from the woman. The Catholic ruffian went down and took the spear and stabbed the baby and ran through the streets with the baby up on the spear. Are oh, you with me, brothers and sisters? When I, when I read the book, I said, I, I, can't, I mean, it, it, you cannot believe what took place. Fox, Book of Mortis. You need to read that. That's a history book. In order to annihilate forever the expressible race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the parnite of the lead bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or person, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at this, at any time, may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the brotherhood of the holy faith of the Slavic Jew. Well, did you understand that part? Wait a minute, read that part. You didn't get that part. Those that are viewing my take, get this part. As at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the brotherhood of the holy faith of the society of Jesus. In other words, what he's saying, if the Pope asks me to do it, or the Father Superior of the Jesuit order asks me to do it. Are you following me, saying? But now what we have we have the Pope and the head of the Jesuit order in one. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you understand this this evening? And this man here is the most cunning man. Look what the prophet says now. And let it be remembered, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. Are you hearing me, saints? It is the boast from Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third are still the principles of the Roman Church. And had she but the power, she's about to have the power, 
She would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Let the principle, listen, saints, listen, saints, let the principle once be established in the United States. Where, saints? Where do we live? That the church may employ or control the power of the state. Brothers and sisters, you better pay attention to that. Because I'm going to show you something tonight. I got 56 minutes left here. I'm going to show you something tonight. You better read that. Brothers and sisters are viewing by channel. This is prophecy update. You better pay attention to what we're talking about tonight. Don't doze off to sleep. Listen to this thing, saints. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state. Listen, get that, saints. That the church may employ or control the power of the state. Remember that for later on. Remember that for later on. That religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is a church. So what, what, let's, let's, let's break this down. Let's break this down, saints. Let's, 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 let's be, be alive here. What is this saying? That the church may employ, that the church man may employ or control the power of the state. What is that saying? That the church would be able to control the state. Remember that. That religious observances may be enforced by, get the point now, saints, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. That's important, brothers and sisters. All right? Here's this, what took place. Look at them. They are hugging. Can you imagine? And when you read what Luther went through and, and what God did for him, to see this taking place 500 years, brothers and sisters, is absolutely unbelievable. Now, I want you to understand something here tonight, saints. I want you to understand something here. We, I want us to be intelligent. One of the things we talk about in our, in our uh, school of the prophets, to be pious, intelligent, and studious. <laughs> Is that right, Brother Margaret? Pious, intelligent, and studious. So I want you to be pious, intelligent, and studious, and studious tonight as, as we look at these things now. You've got to understand some saints that before Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the Church of Wittenberg, there were reformers before him. Anybody know some reformers? Can you name some reformers before? Huss! And Jerome, what happened to Huss and Jerome? They were burned at the stake. There were others, brothers and sisters, but it is Martin Luther that is credited with starting the Protestant Reformation. Because see, Huss was, like, like was killed, him and the, Huss and Jerome was killed like 300 years before Martin Luther ever came on the scene. So the, the, the Romanists was in, in power, they were just doing what they wanted to do, and they started selling these indulgences. Uh, one of their team, top, top men, a leaner, was go going around selling these indulgences. In other words, you could, you could purchase, you could send it, they had a price for any sin you wanted. You could do whatever you wanted to do. Just pay a price to build St. Peter's Basilica. And so Martin Luther is credited with starting the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Now, now, I want you to get this point, I think. So for Martin Luther, the Reformation spread. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Zingwe came on the scene and others, and it spread. Now, to get rid of the Reformation, it has to start with the Lutheran Church. And, from, and then as the Lutheran Church now yields 70 million members, as they yield, then every other denomination yields with them. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? You better follow me now. Every other denomination, and this is already taking place right now as we speak. And we're sitting, saints, I'll be honest with you, we are sitting in calm quietude. Those in authority is not telling us anything. Oh, you understand this, saints? And I, I, hate, I hate to say this like this, but I've got to say it now. We can no longer remain silent. You understand this, brothers and sisters? Look at here. We Lutherans and Catholics are profoundly grateful for the ecumenical journey that we have traveled together during the last 50 years. Now, you know, saints, I'll be honest with you. 
I have been following this for a long time. I came to church in 1976. You know, giving all glory to God. Things like this, I started calculating and, and, and cataloging a long time ago. Back in uh, 1995, they signed a thing, and then one he just read, 19, I have slides on all of this stuff. And I was telling, I was talking about it then. Nobody said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. 2004, I'm going to put it up on the screen tonight. I've been, I've been following this for a long while. So what happened this, this week didn't just happen. It's been a process. It's been a way marked. These things have been ha piece by piece has been put, being put together. We Lutherans and Catholics are profoundly grateful for the ecumenical journey that we have traveled together during the last 50 years. This pilgrimage, sustained by our common prayer, worship, and ecumenical dialogue, has resulted in the removal of prejudice, the increase of mutual understanding, and the identification of decisive theological agreements in the face of so many blessings along the way, we raise our hearts in praise of the triune God for the mercy we receive. I won't comment on that. We'll save that for another time. Think. And here they are, 500 years later, all that Martin Luther did, and when you read, man, how serious it was. Here they are, reciting and singing together. Now, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Take a good look at it. There's Martin Luther in his 95 Thesis, October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther came up with 95 things that was wrong with the sale of indulgences for sin. And he showed from the Bible that the just shall live by faith. And we can go directly to God. We don't need to go to a pope or no priest to get forgiveness of sin. He showed that. And he, he made a trip to Rome, you know, he, that back then. And when he got to Rome, he saw that the debauchery of the priests, the drunkenness and the reveling and the adultery and fornication that was taking place. And he was appalled because this man was serious. And he said, he made this statement. He says, Rome must be built on the top of hell. This much debauchery going on here. But he still was a Catholic. And so he made his journey back to, to Wittenberg because and, 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 he began to preach. And then this uh, Alina came in to start selling these indulgences. He came out against it. And uh, he came out against it and showed how this was wrong and what have you. And they tried to, to stop him, you know, to try to uh, wind him and down him. And he wouldn't hear it. And he kept preaching. And the people's eyes began to be open. 95 Thesis. This is the start of the Protestant Reformation, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, saints? Now, once the Reformation started in 1517 and, 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 it, and it caught on fire and, and people's eyes began to be open and they began to listen to, to uh, 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 Luther and the, 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 the uh, dike there in Worms took place and uh, Charles V had guaranteed him safe conduct, you know, that if he would come to, to, to the Diet of Worms. And, and, and in the meeting, I mean, since you've got to read this, I can't, I can't convey it to you. You've got to read it for yourself. In the meeting, you could, God spoke through Luther and just, just bamboozled these people with an humble spirit. It was a very, um, am I right, brother? A very humble spirit. And, and, and Charles was sitting there the, the, the emperor, and he said, I'm not going to let this monk make a heretic out of me. But then as he kept listening, he said, man, this guy has got it together. But then the, the Romanists persuaded Charles to not become, uh, don't, don't embrace the Reformation. And didn't even want to give him safe conduct back to Wittenberg, but Charles said, no, I give him my word. But once he get back to Wittenberg, we're going to take him. We're going we're gonna to kill him. So on his way back to Wittenberg, his friends captured him, kidnapped him, and took him to a castle that no one knew where he was. And it's there in the castle that the Lord took, hid him out of sight and allowed him to write. He wrote and wrote and wrote. And they didn't know where he was, but they saw his writing. They saw the evidence of his work. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? There he, he, he translated the, 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 the Bible into Germany. I mean, they, they, they were beside themselves. And in the meanwhile, 
Zinc is coming on the scene. <laughs> you know what I mean? Zinc is good. He's coming on the scene. And he's beginning now. He, he never met Martin Luther, but he's beginning to preach the same thing. Now, guess what Zinc was said? He says, it is evident. I never met Luther, but the same spirit that told him is telling me the very same thing. And he began to preach. And they tried to persuade him, but they couldn't stop it. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? So now, what do they do? They said, listen, listen, Zinc, you got to get this. They said, listen, we got to come up with a counter-reformation. We got to come up with some way to stop this. Now, Ignatius Loyola and six of his students went off in the mountains in the cave. Get this, brothers and sisters, this history is so sweet. It is prophecy. They went off into the caves and they came up with the spiritual uh, exercises and started the Jesuit order. Now, the Pope wasn't so much in, in excited about this, but they said, listen, we're going to do anything to protect the Pope and to further the Catholic cause. One of the things, they was going to convert the Muslims. By 1541, the Pope endorsed the Jesuit order, made them official. Are you with me, saints? And so that Jesuit oath that you just saw, that was the purpose of that oath to get rid of all heretics. Are you with me, saints? Now, let me ask you this. Those that are sitting in this audience tonight and those that are viewing my, do you believe that Rome never changes? Do you believe, brothers and sisters, that your purpose is still the same as it always been? Now, now I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm asking this question. I want you to think about it. And you said yes. You answered correctly. But why is that order? Why do they still believe this? I'm, I'm going to give you time to think on it. We're going to talk about it in a minute. All right, so here's the counter-reformation. They came together. All the Catholics from all over the world came together, and they came up, come, to come up with a way to stop the Reformation. Now, this Council of Trent, it's called what, saints? The Council of Trent. The Council of Trent lasted for 18 years, from 1545 to 1563. They met off and on, off and on. And finally, they was trying to figure out how to stop the Reformation, because they couldn't gang say what the Reformers was teaching from the Bible. Are you with me, saints? They could not gang say it. Every time they would try to, listen, see, saints, they didn't want the truth. They wanted to, they wanted to do what they wanted to do. So what they, they couldn't, they couldn't gang say it. They couldn't find no problem, no error with it, what was being taught from the Bible. So what do you think they came up with? They said, listen, we are going to live and teach by the traditions that we have versus the word of God. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And that's where they came up with the idea that we are above the Bible. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? Listen now, brothers and sisters, do you still believe that they believe that they are above the Bible? Yes. Now, brothers and sisters, they believe that they are above the Bible. And they say one of the, one of the reasons that we know we're above the Bible is by the mere fact that we change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and the whole world obeys. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So they said we are above the Bible. So in order to defeat the Reformation, we will say, listen, we are going to live by the traditions of the Catholic faith, what we have come up with. So the way with the Bible, we, we, we interpret the Bible. We say what the Bible is. I'm God on earth. Are you following me, saints? So this is the counter-reformation that they came up with. The Council of Trent, the Society of Jesus, and the Revival of Spirituality. Let's, let's look at that. And this is the Triple Crown. I hope I have time tonight here. I got 42 minutes. Y'all hang with me. We got 42 minutes. I want, I want to get to this triple crown. The Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. You know, saints, this is wonderful. This is the learning center. We're here to learn. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? And this, we're going to do a lot of this here because God's people need to know what's about to happen. Are you with me, saints? And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, you and I, we're going to have to band together for what's coming. Many of us are going to be killed. I'm going to tell you. If you do what God says to do, you believe the Bible? 
Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. The Jesuit movement was founded by Ignacio de Loyola, a Spanish soldier turned priest in August 1534 and made official in 1541. And out of this society of Jesuits comes the spiritual exercises of Loyola. Tell me something that's going on today in our church that deals with these spiritual exercises. Spiritual formation comes directly from Ignatius Loyola. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let me say it again to those that are viewing. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola is now in the seven day Adventist churches. This is still God's church, though. Now you go to Ezekiel, and, and as God showed Ezekiel the things that take place, and Ezekiel said, Oh, Lord, no, they've done nothing. He said, Yes, they've done this, but I'm going to show you a great abomination. So you haven't seen anything yet, saints. But the spiritual formation is directly from Ignatius Laola. Now, when did it come, become popular and begin to, to go into other churches? We need to find out when it happened. Now, you believe that, right? You believe that Ignatius Laola brought the spiritual exercise, right? That's why he brought it into the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church... Em embrace that. But when did it get into the Protestant churches? We need to find out. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Because as it gets into the Protestant churches, this becomes the glue that pulls them together. Now let me ask you a question. What does the prophet tell us that's going to be the glue that's going to bring them together? Let me see if, him, see if I got some Adventists in this audience tonight. What does the prophet say is going to be the glue that will bring the Protestant churches and the Catholic churches together. All right, let me ask you another way. Let me ask you another way. I'm going to quote something. I, I'm, it's going to be up on the screen here. For, now, I believe it's right. Let me see. I believe it's up here right now. Let me, let me see. No, it's not there yet. All right, I'm going to quote something. And I'm quoting to this audience here and to the, to the audience that are in, 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 in Shoundland. Saints, it's time for us to know this. It's time for you to listen. Don't depend on Moses Mason because Moses Mason is probably going to be in jail. And you're going to be in there too if you do what God said. It's time for all of us to become, I'm telling you, saints, this is no more time for us to be uh, just listeners. It's time for us to become doers. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of faith, as they hold in common shall influence the government to enforce their dogmas and sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and civil penalties will inevitably follow. What are the common doctrines? What are the doctrines that they hold in common? And natural immortality of the soul. So what is natural immortality of the soul? Give me another name for it now. Spiritualism. So, the spiritualism is going to be the glue that's going to bind the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches together. Testimonies, volume 7, page 182. Write this down. She tells us this. Are you with us, brothers and sisters? Listen now. So, so here we have the, the Protestant Reformation. I mean, the Counter-Reformation starts. Now, we, we, we're going forward another 200 years. We got the French Revolution. Uh, we got the Age of Enlightenment starts in 1600, French Revolution, 1776 forward, uh, 1789, French Revolution, 1799. And then we know that the Catholic Church received a deadly wound win. All right, so we're moving forward. We moving, we're skipping over a whole lot to get, to get down. 200 years, February 15, 1798, June birthday, marches into Rome and takes the Pope prisoner. There's a lot of history there, saints. You know, I used to listen, I, I used to listen, and you know, brother, I said, why did he do this? And when I went back and started studying the history and saw what was going on during the French Revolution, I found out that it was five men called the Directory that was in control, they were atheists, in control of France from 1795 until 1799, and it was they that sent Berthier down to Rome to take the Pope prisoner. So, here we are, Berthier comes and he takes the Pope's prisoners. At, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push them, because that's what's happening in, in Daniel eleven forty. 40. 
That's the king of the north that was being pushed at. He receives a deadly wound. And what, what constitutes a deadly wound, saints? To all, what constitutes this deadly wound that the Pope received in 1798? Separation. Everybody need to get this. Write it down. Write it down, saints. What constitutes a the deadly wound in 1798 was a separation of church and state. It was a separation of church and state. Brothers and sisters, that's extremely important for us to know tonight. Huh? That's exactly right, my brother. That's right. All right. So it was a separation of church and state. Look what the prophet says now. She says, in many of the nations of Europe, the powers that rule in church and state had for centuries been controlled by who? Satan, working through the medium of the, through the, of the papacy. I forgot I had this little saying here. Yeah, but here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. It had been Rome's policy under profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witness prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open about war upon the word of God. So as Satan saw his ace in the hole, the Catholic Church going down in 1798, he came up with a brand new way to make open about war upon the word of God. Because see, Satan's game plan all along is making war upon the word of God. That's his. Now, let's look at this thing. So when the, when the, when the papacy went down, the head number six actually took over. Open about war upon the word of God. Now look what she says. Let's read it. Let's read it. I want us to read it. Those that are, those that are viewing by channel and those that are in the audience, I want you to read this. I want you to understand this. What does it say? Though a new pope was soon afterward elected, the papal hierarchy has never since been able to wield the power which it before possessed. Question. Question to all of us. What was the power that it had before it received the daily moon? Come on, don't go silent. What was the power that it had before it received the daily moon? It controlled the civil power, and by controlling the civil power, what was it able to do? To persecute and prosecute those that didn't go along with it, all right? So, it has, so once it received the daily wound, the prophet says it has not been able to wield the power that it before possessed. Are you with me, saying? Now, is it able to wield that power today? No, it still can't persecute and prosecute. Are you with me, saying? Get this point, those that are viewing my channel. The Catholic Church still cannot persecute and prosecute. But my Bible tells me that his deadly wound would be healed. And when that deadly wound is healed, he will then be able to persecute and prosecute those that will not go along with him. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Are you following me, saying? Look here. Now she, she makes that, that, that plain. The, come on, the persecution of the church did not continue throughout the entire period of the 1260 years. God, in mercy to his people, cut short the time of their fiery trial. So, the Catholic Church has not been able to wield the power that it before possessed. But I'm telling you tonight that it's on the verge of wielding that power. And brothers and sisters, what do you and I need to be doing right now? We're going to find out tomorrow evening. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's go. Now, what most people do not know is that once the, the papacy received a daily warning in 1798, guess what? It went further down. It got hit upside the head in, in, in 1798, but then 72 years later, it got hit again because the, the Italian government took away the papal states. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? took away all of their sovereignty, everything. Took it away from them. That was in 1870. When was it, that, Saint? So in other words, they got hit in 1798, and, and then 1870, they got counterpunched again, knocked, knocked to their knees. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, most people don't know that. Now, watch this, brothers and sisters. Watch this, brothers and sisters. So the blow was so hard that the Pope 
locked himself in the Vatican. And you know, what, what does the Pope do? Listen to saints. What does the Pope do? He come to his oneness, and what does he do? He blesses the people, right? Now, when he comes to his oneness and blesses the people, what's out in front of him? Come on, talk to me. What's out, where is that, that oneness in the, in the Vatican? What's out, what, what's out in front of that oneness? Come on, talk to me here tonight. The opulence, the sundial, and the street that leads out into Italy. And that's, that place holds tens of thousands of people. And they packed that place for him to come and bless him, right? But once the papal states, this is prophecy, brothers and sisters. This is prophecy update. We need to understand this. Once they received the daily warning in 1798, and then Italy took away the papal states, the pope locked himself in the Vatican and would not come to that one in protest of what had taken place. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Look what it says. A prison in the Vatican, a prison of the Vatican. I tell you, so I can't read this. I tell you. Pope Pius IX was described following the capture of Rome by the armed forces of the Kingdom of Italy on 20 September 1870, part of the process of Italian unification. The city's capture in the millennial temporal rule of the popes. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Over central Italy and allowed Rome to be designated the capital of the new nation. The appellate is also applied to past successors through Pope Pius XI. Are you following me, saints? Watch this now. That's 1870. So he got hit in 1798 and he got kicked in 1870. Are you with me? He's down. Now, while he's down at the lowest point, here, here's the, this, is, this is where it comes on this side. The, the, the one is on the other side. For the next 59 years, the Pope refused to leave the Vatican in order to avoid any appearance of accepting the authority wielded by the Italian government over Rome as a whole. During this period, Popes also refused to appear at St. Peter's Square or at the balcony of the Vatican Basilica, facing it, as the square in front of the Basilica was occupied by Italian troops. During this period, Popes granted the, whatever that is, blessing from a balcony facing a courtyard or from inside the Basilica and papal coronation were instead held at the Sistine Chapel. The period in it, when? When the Lateran Treaty created the modern state of, of 13 acres. Now this 13 acres is a country, are you hearing me here tonight? This is a country that receives ambassadors from every country in the world. When did America send its first ambassador to, that, to, to, to the Vatican? On the wrong link. Brothers and sisters, that's major. Brothers and sisters, that's major. You see, we've got to see in prophecy, in history, the fulfillment of prophecy. Watch it now. Now, while all this is going on, 59 years. While all this is going on, what year was, what year was it that they took it from them? 1870. 1870. Now, question for you. Question for you. Question for those that are sitting in this audience, those... They're viewing by the channel. When was the Great Controversy written? The Great Controversy. All right, that's the second one. 1884 was the first. Then she expanded in 1888. That's the 1888 edition there. It just had more information in it. All right, so let's look at some from... Now, where, where, where's the Catholic Church in 1888? Where's the Catholic Church in 1888, saints? They're down. They're down. They're down. Are you with me, saints? Look what the prophet said. 1888, look what she said. Let's read it, saints. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being. And she's writing this in 1888. And prophecy foretells a restoration of her. Come on, saints. Prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of his heads as he was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wanted after the beast. Question, question to everyone here and those that are viewing by, when will all the world want after the beast? Come on, what, what, does, what, does, this, what does it say? Huh? When will all the world want after? Let's read it. Let's, let's go to that Bible. Let's go to that Bible. Let's go to that Bible. All right. I remember. Let's read it from the Bible. Let's read it from the Bible. Let's go to Revelation. 
Revelation 13, we want to use, I see I have 27 minutes, praise the Lord. Pray for the clock. Are we, are we, are we there, saints? Revelation 13, verses 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So when will all the world wonder after the beast? When the deadly wound is healed. So right now, even though the popularity of Francis and the Catholic Church is very much, right now the whole world is not wanting after him. Are oh, you with me, saints? So we're going to see the world wanting after him more than what we're seeing right now. Are oh, you with me, brothers and sisters? All right, let's go. Look so what she says. And all the world wanted after the beast. The infliction of the deadly wound points to the abolition of the papacy in 1798. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, brothers and sisters, in contrast to that, my Bible tells me in Matthew 24, verses 9, that the time is coming when you will be hated of the, by the whole world. And it says that they will kill you. And you're going to be hated by the whole world. There's a contrast there. All the world's going to be wanting up the beast, and you're going to be hated by the whole world, and they will kill you. And, and, and then John says, they will kill you and actually think they're doing God's service. Are you understanding this? Thing? Are we going to be able to stand during this time, saints? I'm standing up here tonight, and I'm talking to you, and I'm, and I'm rattling this stuff off of you. Am I going to be able to stand when this happens? Am I going to be able to stand are you hearing me, saints? It's going to take more than going to church to stand. Are you hearing me tonight here, saints? It's going to take more than just coming to a meeting like this in order to stand. So tomorrow evening, we're going to talk about what it's going to take to stand. So that's, that's the missing element. Everybody, I've gotten emails, 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 and every one of them had a missing element. Are you hearing me, saints? Here is 1929, Cardinal Gasparia and Benito Mussolini seated after exchanging treaty ratification in the Hall of Congregation, the Vatican, June 7, 1929. The story as reported by the Wisconsin Rapid Daily Tribune, June 7, 1929. Here's a paper, Mussolini and Gasparia signs historic Roman pact. Now watch the next statement, watch the next thing he's going to say. Look what it says. What does it say, saints? So what are they saying? You know, it's, the Spirit of Prophecy says historians will actually use the words that the Bible used. What are they saying? Moral wound was healed. But was the wound healed in 1929? No. It was not healed in 1929. But the process of the healing began in 1929. Even today, the wound is not completely healed. When it's healed, she will be able to exercise the power that she before exercised before she received the daily wound. Are you with me, saints? All right, let's go. The asthma boy, healed, healed wound in many years, Vatican again at peace with Italy after long quarrel. Now, after 1929, what's the next thing that comes on the scene history? And that's a, I'm skipping a lot of stuff. I'm just trying to get to the, I'm trying to get, get to the high point. What's the next thing that happened? What do you see up there on the screen, saints? Vatican II. Vatican II. So what, what, was, what was the Council of Trent? What was that about? I'm talking to everybody. Those are the, what was the Council of Trent about? Remember we talked about it? It lasted for 18 years. What was the Council of Trent about? That was the Council of Rough Mason. Saints, you need to know this. See, we're so accustomed to just listening to somebody. Oh, no, saints, you need to be writing. You need to be cataloging this stuff. Now, so what was the Council of Trent for? 
to, to come up with a counter-reformation. And, and, you know, done, I, I should have put this in there. During the counter-reformation, they came up with a different way to interpret the Bible. Because, see, the Bible was pointing out the Catholic Church as the beast and that the Pope is the Antichrist. And then Martin Luther says, now I know, from studying the Bible, he says, now I know that the Pope is Antichrist. And he says, I despise his bull. The bull was a, a, an authority thing that they sent out. He says, I despise his bull, and now I know that the Pope is Antichrist. So now, so the Catholic Church could not hide from the historical prophetic facts that it pointed to them as the Antichrist. So they said, we're going to come up with another way of interpreting the Bible. All right, Advent is here tonight. Talk to me and tell me what did they come up with? Huh? That's, 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 that's later. This is way, this, remember the NIV is, is way up in, in, in 1980. So we, we way back here, back in the 1500s. Huh? And I'm talking, I wish I could talk to those that are, you listening. So they came up with a new way. I'm going to give you a hint. You ever, ever heard of a man by Riviera? Come on, saints. Where, listen, don't, you, don't we need to have a school? We need to be studying here every day, don't we? Because they came up with another way of interpreting the Bible. And River Air came up with the interpretation of futurism, which put all the prophetic events into the future. But the, the more deadly one was predatism, which put all the fulfillment of the prophecy in the past. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? which did create a void that made them pure and clean. Now, I hate to say this, but I'm about to say now. As of 1940, we started using predatism in the Seventh-day Adventist church as a biblical interpretation. And now it has become widespread in all of our colleges and universities. All the theology students, that's the reason they, that's the reason they ain't teaching you nothing. That's the reason they're not preaching anything, because they don't, they've been taught error. So all of our preachers that are coming out of the seminaries today are coming out under predatism and the NIV. Are you hearing me saying? I just, I'm just touching it. I'm going to do a full teaching on that because this is going to be the learning center right here. We need, we, at this place, a whole about 150 people. We want to fill it up with 150 people. We want to teach. We got to open God's people, God's eyes, people's eyes. Are you hearing me saying? Look here. Vatican II. Vatican II. Now, the Council of Trent that came with the new interpretation of the Bible, and, then, and they were fighting against the Catholic Church. As early as 1929, the Catholic Church said, we will not join with them in anything unless they do what we said do. But then in uh, 1962, they came up with a new strategy. They said, listen, we're no longer going to call you heretics. Are you with me, saying? We're inviting all of the Protestants to Rome. And we want to show you that we have changed. This was George, I mean, uh, Pope uh, uh, John the 23rd. He said, we want to show you that we have changed. Now, I want you to look at this, saints. I want you to look at this place. I, I mean, I, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. Look at this ceremonial stuff that's going on. Now, look what the prophet says. Let's read it, saints. What does it say, brothers and sisters? Many Protestants suppose that the Catholic religion is what? And that its worship is a dull, meaningless round of ceremony. Here they mistake. While Romanism is based upon what? It is not a coarse and clumsy impostor. The religious service of the Roman church is a most impressive ceremonial. Its gorgeous display and solemn rites fascinate the senses of the people and silence the voice of reason and of conscience. So when you walk in there, and when you are in, engulfed in this, it takes away your prejudice. Are you hearing me saying? I'm going to show you that. The eye is what? Charm, magnificent churches, imposing processions, golden altars, jewel shrines, 
choice paintings and exquisite sculpture appeal to the love of beauty. The ear also is captivated. The music is unsurpassed. The rich notes of the deep tone organ blending with the melody of many voices as it swells through the lofty domes and pillared aisles of her grand cathedrals cannot fail to impress the mind with awe and reverence. Just going in there, brothers and sisters, you are taken, you're blown away. Look at here, look at this, look, look at this building. Look at that, how imposing that is. The grandeur, the gold. It's, it's, listen, brothers and sisters. Look here. Look at this bill. Look at, look, at the, look at this thing. I mean, listen, no Protestant in, in, in this church can come in anywhere close to that. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? What's, the, what's this guy that's always grinning down in Texas, got a, got a football stadium for his church? Old Steen can't reach this. Are you hearing me, saints? There is not a Protestant church anywhere can come to that right there. And the money that these people possess, 1.2 billion people membership, look at the money that's coming into their coffers. Brothers and sisters, look at here. Look at the prophecy again. This outward splendor, pomp, and ceremony that only mocks the longing of the sin sick soul is an evidence of inward corruption. The religion of Christ needs not such attraction to recommend it. In the light shining from the cross, true Christianity appears so pure and lovely that no external decorations can enhance its true worth. It is the beauty of a holiness, a meek and quiet spirit, which is of value with God. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Well, watch this now. They invited all Protestants to come. And guess what? Guess what? We went. We went. We had four leaders from our denomination that went to Rome in 1962 and 1965. Now, you just, you, do you remember what we just read? Now, let's see what was the result of these people in going to Rome. Let's see. This is prophecy update. Anybody know who this man is? What did Maxwell do? Huh? What did Maxwell do? I'm all saints. This Adventist. I'm on my Adventist, right? He wrote the Bible story. That is right there. He used to go in all the uh, medical centers and wherever you went to the doctors, he had those books in there. So Ma Max was a good man. I'm not denouncing him, but I'm saying the man got bamboozled. That's what I am saying. Look what he says. First, he says, the friendliness of the Wecker. He says they were so friendly. You see, I've been there several times, that is, to Rome. He's speaking at Loma Linda. He called it, and, he, and look what the name of the sermon is. What's, what's the name of the sermon? Outstretched Hands. That's the name of the sermon, Lama, and when he comes back. Listen. I've been there several times, that is, to Rome. Always a sort of an iceness, they say. It was always kind of an iceness there. He says, but not anymore. Not anymore. And it was evident in so many ways. For instance, in the giving of these press passes, Listen to what it says. Brother who? Lowen was there from religious liberty. Brother Cockrell from the View and Herald. Brother Beach was there from Northern Europe. And I, Arthur Maxwell, was there from the signs. And provided you had a good reason for asking for a pass, you got it. Now let me tell you something. I got to tell you this. I, I know at least three of those men went with Rome. Are you hearing me saying? Maxwell went with Rome. Brother Cockrell went with Rome. And Brother Beach went with Rome. Brother Cockrell denounced. Now, you know who Cockrell was? Cockrell was one of the editors of the uh, of our, uh, uh, commentary. Brother Cockrell denounced the sanctuary. Every, th every all of our release, he denounced all of them. And joined with Desmond Ford in saying it, it was a, a liability. He went with the Catholic Church. B.B. Beach gave the Pope a gold medal and said, this is my friend. 
Oh, you hear me say? Look what Maxwell said. And I, listen, this is still God's church. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to say you need to leave the church. Oh, no, you need to stay. This is the reason you need to stay. Because God said this was going to take place. This is God's church. Was there from the science and provided you had a good reason for asking for a pass you got. If you were an editor or a correspondent for a real newspaper, they gave the pass. And they gave them to people of all faiths. Here, four Adventists got these passes. I thought you would like to see mine, he says. He's speaking to the church in Loma Linda. He says, I thought you would like to see my pass. Look what he says. It's the only document I have which has the cross keys and the triple crown on it. Wait a minute. Why would an Adventist be excited about the cross tree keys and the triple crown? Do you understand what the triple crown and the cross tree keys mean? Do we understand what the cross keys mean? And the triple crown that this man wears on his head? I says, you look what he says. I have to be careful when I show this. I don't want anybody to think that I'm going over to the church alone. But it is a very nice little pass, and it was very valuable. This little pass got me anywhere I wanted to go at the time of the council. That's the triple crown right there. You know what that means, say? That says that the Pope is Lord and God of the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. And here we had a seven-day Adventist bragging about he has this pass with the triple crown. And the keys, the keys, do you know what the keys mean? Brother? You remember the book, Keys of This Blood? You know what the keys mean? It means that the Pope had the keys of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross to rule the world. Only him. That's Brother Cockrell. He gave it up. Brother Beach became a, li a liaison to the Catholic Church. What else happened? You know, do you know, well, I, I, you know, I didn't put this slide, and I'm going to tell you. In his sermon, he says, I, I'll, I'll put that up tomorrow so you can know for sure that I'm, it's true. In his sermon at Loma Linda, this is what he said. He says, we have to stop preaching these sermons from Revelation 13. He says, these people are not to be. And you, by the way, I'm going to put it on, on, on screen tomorrow, but he said, they are not to be. He said, they're not burning Bibles anymore. He says, we've got to come up with some new sermons. These are good people now. Brothers and sisters, Rome, now the tomb. But when he went there, saints, he was bamboozled by what he saw. He was, he was hypnotized. He was mesmerized by what he saw. And so he said, they can't be the beast. They can't be bad. We have made a mistake. We've got, to, we've got to come up with some more sermons. He said, and he said, I've already gotten rid of a lot of mine. That's what he, that's what he preached at Loma Linda. Outstretched hand. Wait a minute. Out of, out of Vatican II. I'm not, I, you know, I got eight minutes left here, boy. I don't know. 1962, Pope John XXIII convened Vatican II Council, a major aim, the merging of all Christendom and finally the blending of all religions across the planet. So what was the purpose of Vatican II? To merge all Christians. The vehicle using celebration activity, celebration terminology, and the power of music to facilitate the change. Now you know why we got celebration music in the church. You know where it came from now, don't you? The liturgical section of the Vatican II document, Volume 1, used celebration related terminology over 500 times. Get the churches accustomed to celebration terminology and the co celebration concept. Every function of the church becomes a celebration. Get the churches accustomed to a revitalized style of celebration service, reduction of inhibition, lots of physical gestures, bodily attitudes and movements. I could talk so much on this. Get set forth song and musical celebration service as the most effective celebration, utilizing popular religious songs and related music to the various cultures and the temperaments of the people. Now you know why we have it. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? This is prophecy update, saints. What has just happened has some serious meaning. Let me hear it. Let's see how much I can get on. All right, look here. Here's John 23rd. He's the one to convene Vatican II. On our right, we have John Paul I. It came on the scene after 
John 23rd. And then we have John Paul II. We all know who John Paul II is, right? All right, you know, this guy died real quick. He, he became Pope and died real quick. And you know, brothers and sisters, when this happened, we said, well, listen, this is fulfillment of prophecy. To some extent, it might have been. But we use it in the wrong way. All right, watch this. Watch it now, say. Who is this guy? Benedict. So when Benedict became Pope, we said, okay, his name is Benedict. So that means this is the last Pope. See, Ellen D. White says we should not use ill-defined ideas as to what constitutes prophecy. We need to be solid when we explain prophecy. We need to be solid. And if we're not solid, don't say it. Don't say anything speculative. Because when the speculative thing passes away, then you're left to be a false prophet. So don't say speculative stuff. Benedict, 2005 to 2013. What happened to Benedict, saints? See, I'm going somewhere and I got to get there quick. What happened to Benedict? He resigned a pope. In other words, he got tired of being God. Come on, talk to me, saints. He got tired of being God. So he resigned. I'm glad the God of heaven don't resign. Have <laughs> mercy. Especially my condition right now. Please don't quit. <laughs> Look at here, brothers and sisters. Do you understand that what Benedict did had not been done in 600 years? A pope and the one that resigned back then was under a different, totally different circumstances. He resigned. And what did he do? He passed the baton to Pope Francis. Now, you know, when Benedict was elected, the cardinals was trying, some of them was, at that time was thinking about trying to elect Francis. And he said, no, I don't want to be Pope. Don't, don't put my name in it. But then this man resigned. And he is called to be Pope. And nobody could believe it. You know, he's 76 years old when he comes on the scene. And so he comes on the scene and says, look, what we got to do, we got to do quick. This is, the word, this is the words the man said himself. He don't know he was speaking prophetically. Now he comes on the scene, and then we have a president to come on the scene in America. I, I, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna have to finish this up in tomorrow evening in our question and answer session, but I don't want to rush. You need to see this. I got four minutes left here. This man comes on the scene and he takes the world by storm. Now, this pope, just like all the rest of the popes, is operating out of a false theology. You know what that is right there, saying? That's a sundial. That's another picture of a sundial. And that's a sundial. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Are you with me, saints? And so, what's the basis of the Catholic Church worship? Look at the Pope Francis. Look how he's looking at that. As if he can look at it some kind of way, he's going to make it holy. Look how he's looking at this thing. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? I want you to get this. Look, look at the look on his face. He's in this spiritual exercise right now. I mean, you really and truly see, see, brothers and sisters, we don't understand. There is a power in Rome. It's just not the power of God. Listen, there is a voice that's speaking to these people. Let me ask you this. Do the voice of God speak to us? When I'm up here speaking sometimes, and God's voice speak to me and tell me something I don't even know. Brothers and sisters, Satan is their God. Now, they don't know that. They are deceived. And so Satan speaks to them. So they are experiencing a power, brothers and sisters. They just know not that it's not the God of heaven. Pope Francis, worship of Sunday. Look at these guys. Look at, look at how they're looking at that thing. This is Satan's counterfeit in order to fight God because his attack is upon the law of God. And that's the reason the Sabbath Sunday is going to be the test to determine whether you and I get the seal of God. That's the reason it is just the third angel's message, brothers and sisters. The third angel's message just warns us against this right here. 
No. There's always been a push for unity. The impulse to unity was acted on almost solely by Protestants in 1920 when the Ecumenical Patriot of Constantinople issued an encyclical summoning all Christians to reunion. Eastern Orthodox churches have been members of the World Council since it was constituted. Ecumenism continued to flourish among Protestants and the Orthodox, for example, in 1950. When, saints? The National Council of the Church was formed by 29 denominations in the U.S. The Roman, listen, listen, saints, the Roman Catholic Church, however, remained uncompromising in its rejection of the movement. Listen, let's read this next part together. From the Roman Catholic viewpoint, church unity could mean nothing less than the return of schismatic sects to the one true church. When was this, saints? 1950. That's 1950. Now watch this, brothers and sisters. What happened in 1962? Vatican II, right? All right, so 12 years later, they have changed. Now, let's go to 1995. Christian coalition wants what? Catholic support. Let's blow it up. Look what the Catholic says at 1995. The idea that there can be some kind of alliance between the Christian coalition and the Roman Catholic Church is nonsense. That's what this Catholic says. Let me back it up. Let me back this up. Here, the Roman Catholic Church, however, remained uncompromising in its rejection of the movement. From the Roman Catholic viewpoint, church unity could mean nothing less than the return of schismatic sects to the one true church. All right, let's go forward. In 1995, the Christian coalition, which was uh, 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 read was heading up, the idea that there can be some kind of alliance between the Christian coalition and the Roman Catholic Church is nonsense. In other words, at that time, the Christian coalition was trying to get the Catholic Church to join with them, but they weren't coming under the Catholic control. So the Catholics are not going to join anything unless they are controlling it. Are you with me, saints? Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? All right, let's go forward. This is 1995. Let's go down to 2004. Wednesday, November 17, 2004. What do we see? We see the nation's Roman Catholic bishops voted Wednesday to join a new alliance that would be the broadest Christian group ever formed in, in the United States, linking American evangelicals and Catholics in an ecumenical organization for what? The first time. You see, saints, this has been a, a process. It's been moving all along. We are now at the final stages of it. All right, my time is up. Let me bring this to a close. We'll pick right up here tomorrow evening, 4 o'clock. So the image of the beast has been formed. What is it waiting on? It now needs the breath of life to, to be given by the two-horned beast. That's, what's, that's what needs to happen right now. The image has been formed. Now I'm going to pick right up here tomorrow. My time is up. I'm going to say this much. This man right here, brothers and sisters, that's the phase of deception. He's subtile because he's a Jesuit. He's just like the devil. He's artful. That's what subtile means. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's beguiling. Beguile means to charm. He charms. He's Beguile means to cheat you and to lead you by deception. This is the man of sin. Brothers and sisters, that is the man of sin. And the Bible says that Jesus cannot come until that man of sin is revealed. Now I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. You and I have been given the responsibility to reveal the man of sin. We'll talk about that tomorrow evening. My time is gone. I want to bring, I want to quickly get through something else right quick. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. I want to get through right here. I'm speaking to those that are in here in the audience and as well as those that are viewing by the channel. Our plans are to have another loud cry school here December the 3rd through December the 6th. Do I have it up there? Yeah, December the 3rd through December the 9th, I'm saying, sorry. Uh, we can only have this school. Now, we have the facilities now, but we can only have this school if we have 25 students. So, 
and we have given to November the 15th. There's people that's calling that want to come to the school, but they want to make sure that we're going to have it because they don't want to buy plane tickets, and then we say we're canceling the school. So what we're seeing here to the audience as well as those that are viewing by the channel, if you intend to come to this school, if you have a desire to come to school, we need to hear from you pronto. November 15th will be the cutoff date. If we don't have 25 students by November 15th, we will have to cancel this school and move it into May of next year. But we are desirous of having it this year, but we need to have uh, the amount of students necessary. And those that came to the first school, I'm going to give you a message. I talked to you at camp meeting. You need to call Brother Robinson. He has a special message for you. Those that was there at the first school, you are, they have formed a group. And they're studying, so Brother Robinson has a message for you. So you need to contact Brother John Robinson. You should have his phone number. If not call me, I can give it to you. But again, I want to emphasize the fact that we have a school plan for December the 3rd through December the 9th. But we need 25 students. So we need you to get on the phone, get in the email, uh, let us know that you're intent to be here, and we'll talk more after Sabbath about it. But we need to hear from you like ASAP. Now again, we will be back here to Sabbath evening at 4 o'clock. It is designated as a question and answer session in which we will deal with what we need to be doing right now. I will finish up this presentation. I only have a few more slides. I will finish up this presentation and we will get right into the question and answer session and deal with what do you and I need to be doing right now in light of the fact, we haven't got to all the facts yet, but in light of the fact that a major prophetic event have just taken place among us, and no one is saying a word. No one is saying a word. And so with that, we want to get on our knees, and we want to have a word of prayer. I mean, I see the hands. Do you, saints, do you see the critical hour that we're in? Is this a critical hour, brothers and sisters? This is a very critical hour. Every one of us has got to get busy. We've got to get busy. Let's get on our knees. And those that are viewing by challenge, get on your knees as well. Let's pray. Let's cry to God. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of that Son, Jesus Christ, we want to be saved. There's things in our lives that is totally unlike you. And Lord, we want you to teach us what we need to do. As we come back tomorrow evening, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be here with us and show us, Lord, in detail. In light of these things that's taking place, I, Lord, it seems like time is very short, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Help us, Lord, to make decisions for eternity. We want to be a part of your team that will give the loud cry, but we know in our present condition, Lord, you can't use it. Lord, you tell us that every secret thing is going to come into the judgment. And Lord, that's the issue. We need to get sin out of our minds. So there's nothing that Satan can use against us. Thank you, Lord, for the information that you shared with us tonight. Go with us as we prepare to go our separate ways. And Lord, according to your will, bring us back on tomorrow evening. Bring others as well that we may continue this study and this prophecy update. In Jesus' name, amen.